This is the Page Publishing Book Club. How you doing? I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. There has been one question getting a lot of attention this year. Are we alone in the universe? Christopher Montgomery is the guy to answer that question. He is a Seattle-based researcher and paranormal investigator for over 35 years. And he decided it was time to share some of his findings in UFOs, A Scientific Inquiry. It was a comp- compilation of, of data that I had collected over the years looking for proof that they exist, and I wanted to publish what I had to update those who are doing the investigation actively and doing field work right now. And you must be pretty interested by a recent report from the government that, you know, they actually appear to be taking UFOs seriously but can't substantiate any anything really concrete. Uh, yeah, the latest report to Congress uh, entails something like that in it. What was really interesting about their report, it almost paralleled what I had come up with in my conclusions in my book, which was a, essentially a study of the military's investigation of UFOs. So are they out there or aren't they? As part of our physical reality, there's something out there. But as far as it being tangible and something you can kick the tires, probably not. Are they hiding from us? Well, they could be hiding from us, or they might exist in a parallel dimension, an alternate universe, another plane. I mean, it's hard to say, but from the information that I've gotten from other people that claim to have been in contact with them and take photographs, and the photographs I've seen, it it suggests they're multidimensional rather than uh, extraterrestrial vehicles. I think it's interesting because there's a wide-held belief that aliens have been around since the beginning of time, but it seems as if recently there's just been a flurry of activity. Is that just our imagination, or is there something going on out there? There's definitely something going on out there, and uh, there's physical proof to substantiate that reality. That's that's the whole point that I'm trying to make in this book, is that even though we don't have anything physically tangible other than eyewitness reports and occasional uh, evidence like photographs or trace evidence, there's really not much more to go on. So uh, it's more a leaf of faith, I think, to believe that they exist uh, as extraterrestrials rather than some other other form of, of life. I'm challenging people to look beyond the veil and to think of what they call extraterrestrial vehicles as, as maybe something more deeply ensconced in, in our uh, minds, in our history, our racial memory, our DNA, going back maybe even to our very origins, the beginning of of mankind or womankind. Uh, What do you mean? Possibly involved in our creation and or a guided evolution, something of that nature. Well, that's, I bet people could debate you for hours on that one, couldn't they? (laughs) Yeah, and I've had people argue with me before, but uh, that's how tangible they are. They're not tangible. And so I would say the sky's the limit as far as, as what they could possibly be. And that's essentially what I think the Air Force presented to Congress was they really don't know what they are. They know they're out there. You know, this phenomenon is real. But as far as putting the finger on what it is and calling it extraterrestrial or terrestrial-based organisms or machines is impossible to say because they just don't have the information. But I've been in contact with the military for years. I'm taking case reports from people on base that are having close encounters with aliens. And that's probably what got me in trouble with the military in the first place is that These people are coming to me. I don't know if they're commanding officers for sending them or what, but when you get a report in in an email from a government contractor on a military base, and now you violated uh, (laughs) secrecy laws, and so I started getting into this big, huge gray area, which is really a no-man's land of intelligence and information that I happen to be privy to, and the government probably didn't want me to have. So I probably know a great deal more than your average UFO investigator just by just by the virtue of being around as long as I have. There have been reports throughout the ages. There was some guy, I think it was in the 70s, out in the Midwest, I think, and he was in a field, and there was a landing, and he was abducted. And he has written a book. There was a movie. Sounds like Travis Travis Walton. Do you believe him? Yeah. I mean, he's saying he was abducted by aliens. He was, like, up on the ship. Is that even possible? A number of abductions happen all over the country, all over the world, all the time. The thing, the thing is, is there's a lot of other witnesses at the time that saw this happening to him. They did take lie detector tests. They passed the lie detector tests with flying colors. And um, 
for all intents and purposes, I'd have to say it was a legitimate uh, encounter. Whether it was an abduction, uh, that's debatable. But you're saying that there's been other reports of alien abduction that you believe? Oh, yes, yes. And if, if you if you read the book, I um, showcase a couple that I was really quite involved with for a very long time and got a lot of information and got to know these people pretty well and have seen the trappings of their lifestyles aside from their encounters. And you could see there was something unusually strange going on by the pictures they would send me of ghost lights or shadows in the room or somebody sitting next to them and there's nobody there. So, I mean, there are other paranormal things going on with these individuals aside from the fact that they claim to be in contact with um, alien life forms. Is it important for us to keep researching this? Yes, it's extremely important for us to keep researching this just for the sake of the scientific value of the information that we're gleaning from uh, the case reports that we're getting. Because every every particular case report, if you look at it from a forensic standpoint, it, it contains information of evidentiary value that could be applied to the field of physics or science or medicine or or time travel, or, I mean, you name it. The sky is the limit. And that could explain the military's interest in it. There is the potential risk involved here, because we don't really know what we're dealing with. And I I suppose probably the military considers them hostile because they they can't identify them. They have no control over them. So sure, I mean, there's always potential risk for good as well as bad. And that's what brought me to my my other hypothesis, which would be the God and devil or angel and demon hypothesis, which they're supernatural or angelic beings, and they do fit that uh, that stereotype as well. You know, that's interesting, Christopher. We could debate that for the next, I don't know, 100 years. Thanks, Christopher. While we're on the subject of creatures from out of this world, T.R. Thomas, who taught creative writing, literature, and speech on the college level for 20 years, has come up with some fascinating characters with biblical ties in the epistles of Simon Thistle. It's a novel about angels battling fallen angels for the souls of mortals. I think that it was sort of generated by when I wrote poetry, and I had several hundred poems published over the course of years while I was a student, but my oldest daughter talked to me continually about writing fiction. These books, I believe, come out of my subconscious. I think about them, and then by the time I sit down to write them, they've basically been written in my head. So the book actually begins in Bismarck, North Dakota, and ends in Helena, Montana. And various small cities are each chapter. The main character, point of view character, is Fanuel, who is the angel of repentance and like a glorified guardian angels, but he does much more because he actually battles fallen angels. Another character is Raguel, who helps him on and off and then continually partway through the book, and he's an angel called the friend of God. And this one is on the cover. She's in the middle of the two angels. A fallen angel called Marchosi is a female. And then there is a watcher angel called Samyaza. And then, of course, I have to include a real archangel, and that would be Raphael. Michael is sort of a bad guy in the wings because if he ever appears, he has an abrupt solution to everything. Then there are some mortals who become major characters. Elise Shreve is a chrismation soldier, and they are like soldiers of Christ, and they operate out of Rome. And then there are the fallen angels, some that are shapeshifters, one that takes the form of a crow, and they all have various motives for being on Earth. But of course, they're all in anguish because they were in the battle in heaven and were cast out. So they target mortals, which is why Fanuel Raguel and Marchosius are trying to help them. And that's the actual plot basis for the book. 
Samyaza as a watcher angel and all of the information I've used to do my characters came from the Bible. So it isn't like I've made anybody up, but Samyaza as a watcher angel, those angels cohabited with mortal females and had offspring, which was a plague for mankind, but because they had children, two of my characters, who are sisters, Donata and Dorina, are part mortal and part angel. And so they're not superheroes, but next thing to it. So how are you telling people about this? Well, word of mouth, but I also used Fiverr. They advertise books, they have websites, they have contacts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Good stuff, Thomas. I really like those characters. Call Marvel, okay? Thanks. We all know what meditation is, but Norman Knoll III, who's been practicing his mindfulness technique since he was a teenager, adds dimension to the practice in Book of Meditation, a Christian method of meditation. I hope to uh, help people grow closer to God. I wanted people to enjoy the inspiration and divine communication that, that I was receiving. I had much success with. Uh, I hope that people would find peace and joy in their hearts and soul by uh, and through uh, meditation. Uh, the main idea of my book is to learn how to meditate first and then, of course, practice meditating. And you start off with three main points, pondering. Uh, using the mind to contemplate scriptures and spiritual things, and then pondering what to pray, you know, thanking the Lord for our blessings, and then asking God questions uh, about our personal life or things that we want to know about. And the third is perceiving, listening to what God has to say, uh, listening for the answers to our prayers perceiving the Holy Spirit and hearing that voice and being able to write that down or perceiving also seeing a vision. So it's pondering, praying, and perceiving. Do you give us scriptures to ponder in your book? Oh, certainly. I go over uh, quite a few different scriptures in my book. You know, in our Christian society, many people think that meditation is just an Eastern practice. Yet, if you study the scriptures, you find that in the, even in the Old Testament, all the way through the New Testament, that people were meditating and talking about meditation. I think most of our prophets in, in the Bible were meditating. I just always assumed that when you were praying, that was a form of meditation. Oh, absolutely. Definitely prayer is med meditation. However, I've received personal revelation pondering. I've received it praying, even visions. However, I have found that perceiving, listening to what the Holy Spirit has to say, I've received far more personal revelations that way. And that it's probably what most of us in our modern hectic world need to learn because our minds are going so much. And sometimes I think, I know myself personally, you know, you'll pray and then you'll just stop. But the idea is to pray and then listen after you're done praying so that God can speak, so that the Holy Spirit can whisper in, into your mind what the answer may be. It doesn't always come right away, but uh, it usually comes. And I've found that when it doesn't come, it, it's usually a sign that we need to, to figure that out on our own. How do you know the difference between your own thoughts telling you what you want to hear or what you need to hear and a message? Well, that's a, a very good question. And I talk about that in my book. And when you first start to meditate, you want to discern which thoughts are yours and which thoughts are coming from some other place, say a divine source. And that's the idea of sitting down to clear your mind so that you can perceive these things. Um, you always want to check this out to make sure the message that you're getting, you know, leads you to believe in Christ, leads you to do 
good things. And that's how you discern, you know, between perhaps you have, a, you know, maybe a temptation or a divine revelation. When I first started having many uh, revelations, I could even hear the tone of the voice and, and knew it was from a divine source. Now that is something to think about while we take a very short break. This is the Page Publishing Book Club. Have you written a book and want to get it published? Then now's the time to call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099 and do it immediately. You see, they're looking for authors of all types of books. And unlike most publishers, Page Publishing will take the time to review most of the books submitted to them. And they'll even give you their feedback. And if they like what they read, Page Publishing will get your book into bookstores and for sale online at Amazon, the Apple iTunes store and other outlets. They'll handle everything. Copyright protection, printing, cover art, publicity and editing. So if you've written a novel, a children's book, a cookbook, inspirational work, a book of poetry or biography and want to get it published, then you need to call Page Publishing and do it immediately. Call 800-204-6099 now for your free author submission kit. Your road to fame and fortune could very well start with this simple phone call. For your free author submission kit, call Page Publishing at 800-204-6099. Hey, we're back on the Page Publishing Book Club. I'm Alice Stackton Rossini. What is more inspiring than your favorite pet? Nothing, according to dog lovers Jeff and Maureen McLaughlin, who share a cheerful tale in their children's book, How Dagny Got Her Pearls. It really just came from, you know, Dagny one day down on the beach. She had this pearl necklace that she loved. And Dagny was born on Cape Cod, and uh, she loved the beach. She loved to swim in the ocean. And one day we were down at the beach, and she picked up this crab who was in distress and, and took him back into the ocean. And we thought that was amazing. And Maureen said, you know, that could be how Dagny got her pearls. And so that's kind of where, where it all came from. What, what do you mean, pearls? Well, Dagny had a pearl necklace. Like a real pearl necklace? Yeah, well, fake pearls, but but yeah, an actual pearl necklace, an actual necklace. And she loved to wear it. She would get so excited when you would bring it out and she would stick her neck out and she would get so excited. But she's a lab setter mix, right? Yeah. They move around. Yeah, yes. It didn't get caught on anything? or Well, I think Maureen had to restring the pearl necklace uh, more than one time because it, it would break and, you know, we'd be picking up the pearls and Maureen would have to restring it. But Dagny was a great dog. Uh, she, she was beautiful. She was a very unique combination of the, of the lab and the Irish setter mix. And so she really, she was very, very pretty and a very nice dog. So Rorky and Wyatt, are they your children? Um, no, they were uh, two other dogs uh, that we have. All the, the names from all the dogs, they, they come from dogs that like we had or I had growing up as a kid or family and friends, you know, their names. But Rorky tells the story to his little brother, Wyatt, and all the other dogs on, on the street. And then Rorky tells the story about how Dagny got her pearls. This reminds me of that movie, Oliver and Company. Yes. Billy Joel voices one of the characters. Okay, I do know what you're talking about, yeah. You should add some music. Well, you know, if we ever do a movie, maybe Billy Joel can be the uh, <laughs> one of the dogs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Why not? So the story is is a sweet dog book. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it's just about kindness and gratitude and there's no people in it it's just the dogs how you know dagny saved mr crab and took him home and mr crab was so happy he told all of his friends in the ocean about it and they made dagny a pearl necklace as a gift as a way to say thank you for dagny saving his life and so that's the basic gist of the story so it is a children's book i i think probably up to about age seven or so um we have gotten the book to some folks that we know that have you know little kids and little grandkids and the feedback from that has has been great that they really seem to like the story and everybody loves dogs i mean so you know you can't beat that we we have gone to some libraries and we're hoping to be able to do some readings up here on cape cod at uh, the local barnes and noble because they ha they have um you know, uh, children's readings for books. 
And they're just getting back to doing that because of they had to shut that down for a while because of COVID. But we're hoping to kind of get back in the swing with that and get on, you know, hopefully on their schedule. That is perfect, Jim. That's definitely the way to go. Thank you. Soka Treats, Destiny and Passion has been a long time coming for Glenda Phillips. But once this New York City clerical worker decided to finish the story she started years ago, she was off and running. I, well, this book has been like 17 years. Uh, I started writing in 2001. And it was like on and off, in the closet, out of the closet, throwing around in the corner. So just one day, just got up, getting ready for work, saw a publishing company, and just decided to go for it. When I gave it to the people, and like, give me your best book, because it's three books in one for this particular Soka Treat Saga. This is the first part of three books. Okay, so we've got two groups of friends. Yes, two groups of friends that uh, meet up at us social club, neighborhood favorite club, bar, or whatever. And uh, it's called Soka Treats. It's just a, a watering hole, as back in the day they used to say, or a hole in the wall if you were living down south. <laughs> but it was more upscale than that, put it that way. All right, so this is your adventures down south. This wasn't in the city. It was a, it was a little bit of both. It was it's a little bit of both. Maxie and Maxie, Felice and Elise, they were childhood friends, you know, fashion girl thing and whatever. So they decided to, and they in the church together doing community work. And they just decided to just hang out for the evening just to blow off some steam, you know, have that hectic work week and everybody on you. They just won. Um, they do a lot of fundraisers and they became well known within the Rochester. You no, know, I haven't went to New Rochelle. <laughs> a new Rochelle, New York, but it seemed like that was the focus at the time. I don't know what I was thinking about at the time, but New Rochelle was the thing, uh, a place to be at the time. I even took some of the, the streets in Brooklyn and made it part of the story, made it part of the church. It's just certain things that's basically right around in Brooklyn. And uh, the, the other group is Cameron Sims and his friend uh, Ray Jones. They, uh, Cameron and Elise is going to get together, and Ray Jones and her and her god sister Felice is going to get together. But they doing by a mutual friend of Maxie, and she's going with one of the senators that is her child's father. But that was a way back history that never was, and it didn't end up later on in the in the story they come together and do they do something amazing well uh, ray jones he got him one of the other friends our uh, childhood friends uh mitchell he's part of uh, cameron's ex-wife vanessa vanessa is the vil one of the villains in the story that is all about her and and nobody else and if she can't get her way you know it's hell with everybody so they get mixed up in her uncle. They mixed up in drug smuggling, kidnapping, just all over the place with murder and all that. She had her own daughter kidnapped and everything. So it's just a, a menage of murder mystery and love and romance and just a, an inspired book to even in the worst of times, no matter where you go, you can find love. Love just hits you. It's, it's just the destiny that's out there. You never know where you can find certain happiness within even the hellish of situations. Is any of this based on any real life experiences? Well, maybe some of my own mishaps and happiness on sad occasions. And then like basically general, general atmosphere, general life, history, uh, just basic love and romance in general not necessarily mine it could be yours it could be your next door neighbor it could be the person on the bus or the train that you meet somebody in the office maybe who knows all right glenda great energy thank you so much finally araceli ritter is a painter and jewelry designer in san diego her native language is spanish but she taught herself english and italian and thought her book a suit for stanley could be a teaching tool and a great children's book that she also illustrated when i was in junior high and high school i participated in uh, creating the the annual for both for the junior high and for high school and so that's where i learned um you know to write uh, different stories for students, uh, you know, what they were going to do in the future, et cetera. And, and of course, we learned to organize the photographs and put illustrations and such. And that was my first experience with um, journalism and 
creating things like that. I was inspired with um, creating a little story for children is basically the way it started. And it's about two bears, one that's got a suit that's too uh, small for him. And his quest is to find the bear that's got the suit too big for him. And then he sets out to find him and so they can switch and they, they can be both comfortable in their own skin. <laughs> and the two bears are Stanley and Stacy, and they just meet up in the forest. And so um, it's, um, you know, the bear goes through the forest and through different little experiences and et cetera, and to find this other bear until he, he finally meets up with him. Okay. Do they, do they have any trouble along the way? A tiny little bit, but it's not a huge drama, so to speak. It's just little things that happen along the forest. Because of Stanley's experience walking through the forest with this funny suit, uh, he was made fun of. So I guess in a way you could say that it uh, it was like uh, somebody making fun of him, you know. And um, uh, so it's it's a lesson there, too, that, you know, it's not necessary. And when he finally meets up with Stacy, um, they're both in their comfortable with their, you know, in their own skin, so to speak. The title of my book is A Suit for Stanley. And in Spanish, it's Un Traje para Stanley. So is this book written in Spanish, Italian, and English? It's written in English and Spanish. Nice. Now, are you are you able to read this to kids to see what they think about it? Well, what I did is I, I um, took some of my books to the Radies uh, Children Hospital. I, um, I donated some for the children to, to read. Um, we have an area called Seaport Village. They have a, um, a bookstore over there, and I could read to children. And, of course, uh, there's Barnes & Noble. They're carrying my book. Yes, they are. All right, Araceli, we are out of time. Thanks to all for hanging out with the Page Publishing Book Club. Download the podcast at 710WOR.com and uh, try to enjoy that holiday shopping. New York City is back, I can tell you that, and it is a madhouse. Buy books for Christmas. I'm Alice Stockton-Rossini. I'll catch you next time.